Obrigada e obrigada à organização pelo convite para estar aqui mais uma vez a participar neste festival. Eu confesso que não estava à espera de ter tanta gente no público, portanto, obrigada, muito obrigada por terem vindo. Aqui se vê também a força dos livros e a força dos leitores. Portanto, mais uma vez, muito obrigada por estarem aqui, apesar de estarmos numa sexta-feira ao final da tarde e com esta chuva intensa de vez em quando a cair. Muito obrigada à Eleanor Catton e à Ana Bervoitz por terem aceitado esta, esta conversa aqui neste, neste festival. Já agora um festival que tem tudo para correr bem, como se diz em Portugal, casamento molhado, casamento abençoado, portanto, festival molhado, festival abençoadíssimo. Portanto, estamos aqui a dar o pontapé de saída para mais uma edição do fólio e temos a certeza que vai ser, obviamente, um grande festival. Bem, como disse, contamos com duas convidadas, duas convidadas já autoras de uma obra importante, Ana Bervoetz, nasceu em Amsterdão, autora de sete romances, mas também já escreveu contos, peças de teatro, guiões, ensaios... E também Eleanor Catton, que nasceu no Canadá, foi criada na Nova Zelândia, com os Luminares, publicado, livro publicado também em português, conseguiu vencer o Man Booker Prize e é até hoje a mais jovem vencedora deste, deste prémio. Em Portugal, Ana Bervoet tem publicado o o livro Tivemos de Remover Este Post e Eleanor Catton, para além de Os Luminares, que também já foi adaptado para a televisão, este mais recente, A Floresta de Burnham, o romance que, e vamos tentar perceber isso, se ela realmente levou 10 anos a escrevê-lo, porque é o primeiro romance que publica depois dos Luminares e de ter ganho este prémio. Bem, o nosso tema é a desordem e a minha primeira pergunta acho que é muito fácil. Qual será o papel do escritor nestes tempos desordenados que vivemos? Contribuir para a desordem ou tentar um, arrumar esta desordem? Ana? Eleanor? I don't know. Oh, sure. Who's going to be first? Okay, so I'm not sure if I... Can you do the question in English? Maybe we'll... Yes, of course. What should, the, what should be the role of the writer? Uh, should a writer contribute to increase the disorder that we are living today or to give some solutions to organize this disorder? <laughs> do you want to go first, Eleanor? We were promised beforehand that the questions were going to begin easy and then get harder. Yeah. Um, so this is, this is very frightening to, be <laughs> to, to begin with this incredibly difficult question. Um, you know, I, I, I feel very strongly that there, there shouldn't be any Sorry. limits on what a creative writer can, can or cannot do kind of almost especially in times of emergency or times of crisis. Um, it, sometimes it can feel as a writer when you look at the news and you, and you kind of see the, uh, the speed at which we're hurtling somewhere kind of desperately unknown and kind of unprecedented. It can, it, it, it can feel as though that is a kind of a responsibility. It can, it can, it can feel as though that needs to translate into the work somehow. Um, and so I've definitely felt that, that urgency as a writer, but I, I would stop short of ever saying that I think that anybody should write in, in a particular way as, as a kind of a, res, a, as a response to the world. Um, partly because I think creative writing, kind of the business of making art, um, has to do with dreaming up things that don't exist yet. And you don't yet know what the, what the result of, of what it is that you create is going to be in the world. You know, it, it can sometimes be that bearing witness to something by rendering it exactly as it happened is the politically responsible thing to do and can, ha can kind of bring about great political change. But it can also be the case that doing the opposite of that and showing the world very much unlike the way that we come to understand it, can have kind of great political impact. Um, and we kind of don't really know until we try it. So I, I, I would be, um, I'd kind of fall on the, on the side of um, a kind of a very hands-off approach to that question, I suppose. Anna? Oh, oh I have my own mind. 
mic, oh my god. Yes. Sorry, I was just politely waiting to get it. Um, no, I could not agree more, you know, I don't think that literature should or should not do anything. I think literature is a free space, so there's, it doesn't have to be political, but if a writer wants it to be political, that's cool. Um, and of course there's personal taste. I am like the most organized person, well, at least in my street, I guess, at home. I'm super organized, I hate chaos. Um, I get very disturbed by disorder. Um, so I don't really love it when artists, you know, writers or musicians or whatever, when they say, oh, my work is meant to confuse or I, I, I'm trying to confuse my audience and then confuses, confusing your audience is supposed to be a good thing, but I sometimes ask like, why would you want to confuse your audience? Um, so, but I think what I, the, the kind of literature that I love and what I also love about your book, at least the parts I've read already, um, is that it can show the complexity of human emotions, but also of human decision making. And in my own work also, I just love to show or try to show why people who think or who perceive themselves as good people still can make bad decisions. Why do they do that? Why do we do that? So that's something I'm very interested in. So that you might see as a form of clarity, maybe, you know, a form of explanation. Um, but I don't think we're even able to solve anything uh, without being too cynical. <laughs> Mas a Ana uh, tocou, na minha opinião, aqui num ponto muito interessante e que tem a ver com a tomada de decisão. E eu acho que este é um dos ingredientes dos livros de ambas as autoras. Se, no caso da Eleanor, e vamos focar no mais recente, A Floresta de Burnham, que é uma espécie de eco-thriller, uh, um, um, um livro onde, onde a proteção do planeta se debate uh, com a exploração do planeta, como é que conseguimos criar um equilíbrio entre aquilo que precisamos para uh, a nossa vida diária, digamos assim, e e a conservação do planeta e, portanto, aqui também há uma tomada de decisão. Precisamos de tomar uma decisão sobre em que lado é que estamos e como é que vamos alcançar este equilíbrio. Já também no livro de Ana Bervoetz isso ainda é mais evidente porque a parte desta realidade eh, difícil e dura que é vivida não só pelas pessoas que têm empregos precários nestes call centers mas sobretudo neste caso mais concreto temos um conjunto de, de personagens e, e sobretudo o livro é centrado numa personagem feminina em que estas pessoas têm a difícil tarefa de perceber o que é que pode ser publicado numa rede social o que é que é permitido e o que é que não é permitido e sobretudo quando as regras são poucas e as regras estão sempre, estão sempre a mudar. E eu penso que este é um dos aspectos comuns a, a, a ambas, na obra de, de ambas e gostaria que comentassem um pouco, um pouco isto porque talvez, talvez o papel dos livros e da literatura também seja este, ajudar a uma tomada de decisão um pouco mais esclarecida ou então tornar esta tomada de decisão um bocadinho mais cinzenta e obrigar-nos a nós, leitores, a conhecermos, como se costuma dizer, os dois lados da barricada. Nada na nossa vida é branco ou negro, ou quase nada. Há aqui uma zona grande de cinzento onde as nossas decisões são importantes. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that's such an um, interesting question that, in a way, kind of gets to the heart of what the novel does best as a form. Um, I, I think that uniquely among art forms, um, the novel is kind of inescapably moral. You know, it, it has to do with why it is we act in the way that we do. What, what are the intentions that go into our actions and what are the outcomes of those actions, whether they're intended or not? Um, and unlike any other art form, the novel can situate you inside of another person's consciousness, inside their body, inside their mind, inside their memories, um, as they are making these choices that are affecting um, the world around them. And I think inevitably that that helps you to think in a more interesting and complex way about the choices that you're making in your, in your own life. 
Um, but again, this is kind of my hesitation about putting too many guardrails around this question. I, I think that it's, it's also really important to remember that a person making a choice in a book and a person making a choice in real life are two completely different things. Because of course, a, a novel is made up, you know, so the, the choice that they're making is in service of a work of art. It isn't really affecting any change in the world, um, I except for if you take into account how it's gonna be read. Um, and so I think that, that that element of the kind of fiction, the, the fictionality of fiction, the, the, the fact that it is made up, um, has to kind of come into play when we're talking about literature. Um, to me, I find it a very useful and, and kind of fascinating thing to be able to um, live inside people who are unlike me and see them acting badly as well as acting well, see them being surprised by themselves and being surprised by the consequences of their own actions. Um, but I, I, I'm not sure if I would say that that's the point of literature. It's, it's almost more like a happy byproduct rather than its purpose. So could you summarize? So from the answer, I'm deducting that the question was, is literally supposed to be moral or? Não, não exatamente. A pergunta é uh, até que ponto, e uma vez que esta questão da tomada de decisão é, é central em ambos os livros, nomeadamente no da Ana, reside esta responsabilidade neste grupo de jovens de decidir o que é que pode ser publicado numa rede social e o que é que não pode, e a fronteira pode ser uh, muito cinzenta, e voltamos aqui à desordem, não é? À desordem, à desordem do mundo, uh, e, e que para mim, este é um ponto também central uh, deste, deste seu livro, que é este processo de tomada de, de decisão, uh, e que nos pode, e através dos livros podemos perceber como a nossa realidade tem muito pouco de branco ou negro, e há estas zonas aqui de, de cinzento, bem, em que lá está, o escritor pode ajudar a clarificar ou não, permitindo-nos conhecer o outro lado, a experiência do outro. Yeah, well, I think you're, you're right on that. Um, so my book, for the people who haven't read it yet, is about commercial content moderators. I think you told a little about that. Um, these are the people that work 24 hours all around the world to keep our social media safe and clean. And whenever we flag content, it's their job to decide whether or not they should remove it according to the moderator guidelines. And I think this adheres to your question, because one of the things I found super fascinating about this job, this practice, this moderating, was the fact that these moderating were constantly navigating these different planes of morality, but also these different planes of reality. Uh, because on the one hand, you have the moderator guidelines, right? These are the rules made up by Facebook about what gets to be up. So Facebook doesn't want very famously uh, the woman breast not to be shown, but the male breast is okay. So this is kind of a random guideline based on a vague sense of Christian Western morality. Um, but they do need to listen to that. That's their job. Of course, on the other hand, they have their own sense of morality, their own sense of what's right and what's wrong, because the way they were brought up or the, the way their personality is. And then I found in my research that um, when content moderators do this job for a while, they develop a new sense of reality and maybe even a new sense of normalcy, because uh, you must imagine they see the most horrible things, you know, every day. They see animal violence, child abuse, hate speech, all that. And even though you won't hear them say that that is right, for them it's kind of normal. They're not that shocked anymore. So their perception of reality or of morality does kind of change. So I was very fascinated by how they need to navigate these three uh, planes. And that was one of the reasons I wanted to write about it. So I guess for me as a writer, there was something there even though um, I, there wasn't one point I wanted to make. I thought that was like on a, almost on a philosophical level, very interesting. 
Ok, estava só a acabar que, que pudessem traduzir para não, para não, para não, se, não se perderem na nossa, na nossa conversa. Uh, tal como dissemos, uh, também isto acontece no livro de, de Eleanor, uh, A Floresta de, de Burnham, de Burnham, aliás, uh, que na verdade é o nome de uma organização uh, sem fins lucrativos que se dedica a tentar proteger o planeta e que aproveita e, e pratica a agricultura em, em alguns terrenos de uma forma mais despercebida, digamos assim. E de repente há uma proposta para que eles ocupem um determinado território e, pronto, e o resto vão ter que ler, vão ter de ler o, o livro para, para perceberem como é, que, como é que termina. Este livro foi o romance que escreveu e publicou depois de Os Luminares. Foram 10 anos para, para escrever este, este livro. O que é que, mais um livro já agora, situado na, Nevo, de, na Nova Zelândia, tal como aconteceu com Os Luminares e com o ensaio, também publicado em, em português, um, o que é que ele levou a abordar, a abordar este tema? É, é esta desordem que existe e esta duplicidade que existe no indivíduo onde não podemos deixar de usar o nosso telemóvel e que precisa, por exemplo, de lítio para, para termos a bateria para utilizarmos o telemóvel, mas ao mesmo tempo também queremos proteger o nosso planeta e preocupamos-nos muito com as questões da conservação. Foi este, esta duplicidade que, que talvez a levou a escrever este livro? Sim, foi... Foi a growing kind of interest that I had in the future, actually, um, that, that came about following the election of Donald Trump in 2016 and the, the Brexit vote in the United Kingdom. Um, and this kind of new disenchantment that I, I, w I was kind of seeing in, in, in myself and in the people around me with um, social media in general. I think that at the beginning of the 2010s, there was a kind of a great optimism about social media, that it was going to bring about this kind of new era of democratic engagement. Um, there was the Arab Spring and the o Occupy protests, and it, it kind of felt as though it was a um, it, it, it could be a force for good in the world, a kind Ou of seja, a democratizing force. Estaríamos a evoluir para um mundo menos desordenado. <laughs> Right, right. I think that there was there was optimism about that, and then um, quite decisively with with the kind of the events of 2016, it felt that like that that really changed, and I became really interested in the reactions of the people around me and and of myself um, included, um, and th there was one particular thing in in um, that, that 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 really kind of piqued my interest, which was that it seemed that almost everybody around me when they were responding to these global events were saying that the world was hopelessly polarized and um, the, there was a great gulf between left and right or um, young and old or, or whatever it was. And, and this was a big problem. And then the next thing that they would all say is, and the people who I think have to change are them. It, 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 was, it was never uh, any kind of... Um, um, responsibility was taken for this 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 polarization, and I, I, I found that very interesting. And I started thinking about this this question, you know, the the possibility that I think it's very hard for all of us to wrap our heads around, which is, what if I am the problem um, politically? Not what if I am the villain of the piece? Not not just. In, in, a, in a general sense, but, but in a very specific sense. You know, what if, what if I am actually the villain of the story and I don't realize it? Um, and it was around about this time that I, I decided to go back and reread Shakespeare's Macbeth, um, partly because I thought it might have some sort of a clue, um, it, it might contain some truth to, to help me answer this question about why we were all so reluctant to um, kind of acknowledge our part in, in, in this kind of cosmic drama that was playing out. And um, I was so excited when I went back to this play because I had I'd read it in high school, as many people do, and I had always been taught that it was a play that was about ambition, that um, Macbeth will just do anything to become king, and, and um, it's the kind of handbook for um, a, a story of ambition. And when I went back to it, I suddenly thought, I, I don't think actually this is right at all. I don't think this is really a play about ambition because... 
Macbeth realizes him, his ambitions so early in the play. I think that instead this is a play that actually can, can tell us quite a lot about social media and can tell us about what happens when we, ha we, we invest the, our idea of the future with this kind of certainty. When we're, we believe that something we're being told about the future is absolutely definitely going to happen, that in, in a sense, we kind of make it come, we make it come true in the sense that Macbeth believes the prophecies that he's told in the play, and because he believes them, he, he then makes them come true. It, they, they wouldn't have come true if he hadn't believed in them. Um, and and so this kind of really excited me, and I, I ended up with the, the kind of the form of the novel kind of came to me first, which was that I wanted to try and write a book that was about contemporary political issues, um, but the, it wasn't at all going to be a book that was um, uh, kind of advancing a certain point of view. Instead, each one of the characters could plausibly be the bad guy of the book, um, but of course none of them would see themselves that way. Um, and so the, the book would be a kind of a, a riff on Macbeth, it would be a kind of a, a take on Macbeth. Um, that, that wouldn't really follow the plot of Macbeth, but it would take these central themes and, and, and sort of um, puzzle over them in, in a way. Bem, e a Eleanor acabou de, de falar de, das redes sociais uh, e, e voltamos ao livro da, da Ana Berwood, porque um, é também um alerta, uh, não só para, para aquilo que, que se passa na internet, e, e eu penso que durante muito tempo, e ainda hoje, uh, há muita gente que, que tem esta esperança nas redes sociais, maior, mais democracia, maior, melhor acesso à informação, e uh, isso poderá não ser necessariamente assim, aliás, uh, também isso é, é mencionado neste pequeno grande livro de Ana Berwitz, as questões das fake news e, do que, e, do que, e das teorias da conspiração que vão, que vão ganhando terreno nas redes sociais, a Terra é plana, por exemplo, e o Holocausto nunca, nunca existiu, um, ou seja... Aquilo que eu pergunto é, haveria uma certa esperança de um certo ordenamento do mundo com, esta, com, esta, com a internet e com o facto de podermos estar todos ligados e a conversar com uma pessoa do outro lado do, do, outro lado do globo? Na verdade, se calhar, Ana, será que nos entusiasmamos demais com, estas, com esta possibilidade? Sim, estou ainda muito positiva sobre a internet, porque, você sabe... We can talk a long time about what's wrong with the way, especially um, that social media are structured and meant to make us addicted to them. We can talk about that, but imagine a world without the internet and how would that be for people with certain diseases, queer people, marginalized people, people in war. Um, I don't think that would be a better word necessarily. Um, and I was introduced on the, to the internet at a very young age. My dad was a hacker and he was one of the first persons in the Netherlands to go on um, pre-internet. So there's something that's called HIV net. And it is what it seems. It's a pre-internet that was just about connecting HIV patients in the early 90s with each other and the medical community. That was before the World Wide Web uh, became big. So one of the first functions was actually connecting these patients and was spreading knowledge. Uh, and I think that's still like the most wonderful thing that the internet does up till now. But the question is, um, should we be connected and should we spread our knowledge and should we find our, our people through social media? Or are there other ways? Of course, it started with, um, well, it started with HIV net, but then there were mailing lists and then there were forums. Should we go back to those forms? And maybe those forms shouldn't be owned by big tech companies. Those are questions we can ask, but I think there's nothing wrong with the internet or Uh, connecting with people around the world in general. So I still share that utopic vision and uh, yeah, there are some changes that we need to make, you know, in the algorithm, in the way that they structure, in, in, when it comes to ownership, when it comes to legislation, of course, um, but I'm still optimistic, yeah. 
Portanto, o que se depreende destas palavras é que o principal problema do nosso planeta é mesmo o ser humano <risos> e do uso que fazemos das próprias tecnologias que, que criamos e que, e que acabam por ganhar uma certa, uma, certa vida, uma certa vida própria. Daqui a pouco vamos abrir espaço para que também possam colocar perguntas às, às, nossas, às nossas convidadas, mas, mas eu não, não queria deixar passar aqui esta oportunidade de também de lhes fazer mais uma pergunta. Uh, recentemente, numa conversa com a Nobel da, da Literatura, o Olga Tokarczuk, um, ela confessou que sente um bocadinho o fardo de, neste mundo desordenado, confuso, violento em que vivemos, os leitores procurarem na ficção respostas a estas questões, procurarem na ficção respostas para, para, esta, para esta desordem. Será que também sentem essa, essa responsabilidade? Responsibility? Mm. No. But, I mean, it feels weird to not respond to the things that are going on, which you were saying when we were started. You know, as a writer, you're always asking yourself, like, what do I do with this without it becoming like a cringe metaphor or this or that? And I do remember um, thinking that uh, there was two moments where I thought that maybe fiction was dead, which it wasn't at all. But that was when Trump was elected for the first time. It felt so heavy and awful that it felt so weird to write something frivol as fiction. It felt weird to do that. And then a week later I did that, but that was a moment where I was like, should I be still having this job when the world is, we thought it was ending back then. Maybe the ending started then, but um, we're still alive. And then with the pandemic, I was sure that at least science fiction was dead. Because I thought, I'm a science fiction writer also, or I incorporate science fiction tropes in my literature, not with this novel, but with other novels. And I thought that whenever uh, a novel was set in the near future or in the far future, it would seem like a weird metaphor for what we were going through right now for the pandemic. So there were moments that I questioned uh, what I was doing, but I did come back from that, I guess. Um, I think it's always a negotiation as an author, you know, where you stand in the world, what your interests are. I, I always follow my own interests. Um, and well, luckily for me, there, my interests lay in things that happen in the world right now, I guess. É curioso, a Ana, ter escolhido estes dois momentos porque correspondem a um, em, em alguns países, não em todos, a um pico de vendas, de aumento de vendas de livros. Ou seja, quando Trump foi, foi eleito, houve um aumento da venda de alguns títulos, nomeadamente o 1984, de George Orwell, nos Estados Unidos, e durante a pandemia também houve países onde se compraram mais livros, as pessoas estavam em casa, tinham mais tempo livre e, e liam mais. Portanto, é curiosa a Ana ter escolhido estes dois momentos <risos> em que se questionou, enquanto escritora, quando, lá está, os leitores voltaram a tentar procurar respostas, respostas nos livros. Eleanor. I mean, this is, this is a topic I, I've given a lot of thought to over the last five years, and I, I, I definitely empathize with what you're saying. Um, where, where I've arrived at is almost the opposite, um, though, of a, kind of where I started out, um, which is that I, I, I feel as though social media has, has given the novel a cause, actually, and it's given it a, um, an, a kind of an urgency and a purpose in, in a way that maybe it, it's, it's almost never had before. Um, The idea of a plot, of, of something that has been designed for the reader's pleasure, um, something that where, where meaning is going to um, arrive, it's never going to, to kind of dissipate in chaos or kind of meaninglessness. This is, I think, one of the few things that you can never get online. And it's one of the reasons why conspiracy theories are just proliferating, because we We are so desperate for meaning. We're such meaning-making creatures as human beings. Um, and so I kind of, I've, I've, I've kind of come out the other side, actually, at, at the, the other side of that depression. And, and I now feel that there's this kind of amazing case to be made for fiction because we, we, we seek this meaning. We, we seek closure. You know, for, for so long we've been told that 
escapism as something that's kind of morally um, deficient, um, that, that reading for pleasure is something that, you know, you, you, you would be better spent, your, your time would be better spent um, agitating or um, uh, taking to the streets or, or, or whatever it is. But I, ju I just don't, I think that that's, that, that, that misunderstands the great need that we have for story, stories to, to situate our lives in narratives that have meaning and that, um, the, that, that make life worth living to us, you know, that make life more interesting and more, more complicated. Um, yeah, so, but I, I, I definitely empathize with what you're, what you're saying. <laughs> Já agora só apenas acrescentar que neste momento a lista dos livros banidos das bibliotecas e das bibliotecas públicas e escolares nos Estados Unidos tem aumentado nestes, nestes últimos meses. Qualquer pessoa pode denunciar ou dizer que aquele livro não é adequado e em alguns casos há uma avaliação, noutros não, mas de acordo com o Pan America, a lista dos, dos livros banidos das bibliotecas públicas e escolares nos Estados Unidos têm aumentado muito todos os meses e estão lá nomes como, por exemplo, Margaret Atwood. Bem, vamos às vossas perguntas. Ninguém? Tá? Ah, temos ali uma questão, parece-me. Não, vi mal. Ah, temos aqui uma questão, aqui este senhor. Ah, não. Não se sinta pressionado. Vamos aqui dar mais algumas, mais uma oportunidade. Então, posso, posso, posso fazer eu, então, mais uma, mais uma pergunta. E já agora isto tem muito, um bocadinho, é uma pergunta um pouco mais, mais pessoal. Um, os livros ajudaram-vos a, a entender... Que livros é que vos ajudaram a compreender e a entender o mundo? Já agora, que livros é que vos formaram enquanto também escritoras? We both want the other one to go first, I think. <laughs> This is a super hard question and I don't have like one answer to it, but I always tend to like go back to my childhood, because that was such a formative period, I guess. And that was also the period that I read the most. For some reason, I was such a bookworm as a kid. So I, I cannot name one book that helped me understand the world, but I remember this book called by Astrid Lindgren. So she's, I think, a Swedish uh, children's book writer. Um, the Brothers Lionheart is, I think, the, you know, the English title. In Dutch, it's The Gebroeders Leeuwenhart. And it was about these two brothers and then they died. And then they started living a new life in a fascist-like surrounding. And I do not know why, but I find myself always going back to that book. And there's several of my novels that uh, relate to that book in some sense. And I think it's two things that spoke to me. Of course, I guess the political part, you know, the fascist country, but also the dying and the afterlife and the making up stories. and. I don't know, somehow that book keeps coming back. Yeah, I, I can't think of a single um, novel really either, or, or, or other book. Um, I, I had the same, a very bookish childhood. I, my, my mum was a librarian when I was growing up, so I was kind of surrounded by books. Um, but I, I, I suppose I'm a little peculiar in that the, the moments in my life where I always know that I have an idea for, uh, to write a story, I usually, when I'm reading something that I don't like very much, um, and I find that incredibly inspiring, and I, I will often get very angry with the book, and there's something in that kind of rebellious anger where I think they could have done this so much better. Why did, why did they miss this opportunity? That then I realize, okay, well, the only person that's going to write that book is you, you know, um, which maybe kind of comes back to the first question that you asked. I, I think that this, the, the ways that we respond to things are so surprising and kind of, and, and, They, they, they don't always follow a kind of an, 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 an ordinary path, a kind of a smooth path. And sometimes it's in reactions against things that the most good can, can come. Um, yeah, so I've, I've, I've derived a lot of um, uh, 
kind of inspirational benefit in my life from books that have just really jarred against me. Or I love it. <laughs> Can you name one, or would that be like naming um, and shame? Well, one of them, the, the luminaries kind of came out a, a little bit of, um, with a kind of great dissatisfaction with an Italo Calvino novel, um, The Castle of Cross Destinies, um, which is based on a tarot spread. Um, and I was so excited by the idea of this novel and started reading it and was just immediately so bored and so angry at how bored I was. <laughs> and then so decided to write <laughs> a book I love of this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Portanto, é caso para dizer, vamos esperar que a Eleanor fique aborrecida muito rapidamente. Para que, não teremos, para que não tenhamos que esperar mais 10 anos pelo próximo, pelo, pelo próximo livro. Uh, a Ana costuma ser um bocadinho mais, mais prolífica na sua, na sua produção literária. Já agora, eu sei, ninguém gosta de falar nisto, mas os leitores querem saber em que é que estão a trabalhar. Uh, I'm working on my 10 novel and that's with my editor right now. So I have some days off to be here. And ho hopefully it will come out next year. But maybe it will never come out. You know, I'm still... <laughs> okay, that's weird to say. <laughs> it's done, but I'm like not... I'm not happy with it yet. And like, um, when I started writing... So I'm a writer that really plans everything. I want to know where I'm going. Uh, because I'm so afraid to throw something away. I'm so afraid to get stuck. And um, three years ago, I planned this whole novel about a woman that went back in time, da 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 da, and it didn't work, and I threw it away, and it was so freeing. I am never scared anymore to tr just throw something away when it doesn't work, like that freed me. So with this novel, if I don't get it right, I'll just start over, and that is like a very freeing thought and something I learned as a writer. That's why I said that. Eleanor, estamos aborrecidas? Portanto, preparadas para escrever o próximo livro? <laughs> I have started writing my next book, um, but I'm, I'm very similar to you. I have to have um, a sense of an ending before I can really feel like I can start. A kind of a, a sense of the formal uh, kind of goals of the book or the, 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 the shape of it, really. The, the, the size of the vessel that I'm going to try and fill. Um, and with this, this new book, I have a title, and I have a beginning, and I have two plot twists, and I don't have an ending, oh, and so exciting. it's meaning that I can't, it's, it's, it's a very strange position to be in, because I, I kind of can't move forward with it until I, I figure out how it's going to end. That's exciting. <laughs> Muito bem, última oportunidade para colocarem as vossas perguntas. Ninguém, ninguém. Maza? Yes, we have a question. Já agora aproveito para fazer publicidade. Maza Mengiste, autora de livros que devem ler. So, penso que só tem um publicado em, em Portugal neste momento e faz parte da coleção A Vida Privada dos Livros, que é uma coleção em parceria com a RTP. E por isso, muito obrigada por também ter colaborado com esta, com esta coleção. E a Masa também uh, vai estar aqui em vários momentos do fólio e, por favor, não percam, porque vão perceber, ela é excepcional também. Ops... Uh... Uh, thank you both for, for this. It's really wonderful. Um, I wanted to ask you, I think, a question that uh, I've been thinking about a lot recently, but I've been having conversations with, with other writers about um, really the, the writer's place in this world that seems to be... Uh, Eleanor, you talked about, you know, we need these stories. We, stories are how we, we move through this world, but we're living in a time when it is one narrative against another, mm -hmm. one memory against another. Um, and there has been so much uh, on social media. That, again, the battle continues on social media. And I would love to hear you talk about uh, maybe your place in, in the midst of this or maybe the place of literature or maybe even words, because I think we're at this point as writers, some of us are getting quite dis distrustful of words and what they can do or cannot do. 
Yeah, I, that's such a great question, such a hard question. Um, one of the things I find very troubling about social media is how it reduces almost everything to a zero-sum game. Um, we've become very comfortable with the idea of a zero-sum game these days. We kind of conceive of every, every battle in these terms. So every reality TV show, that we're always being told that there can only be one winner. And even more um, uh, dangerously than that, that one person's success will mean another person's failure, um, that those two things are, are, are always linked together. Um, and f f for my research for Burnham Wood, I, I, I'm not a gardener myself, but my, the main characters in these books are, are kind of guerrilla gardeners, so I did a lot of um, research into gardening and, and uh, wanted to know more about the natural world. And it, it, it struck me that th this whole idea of a zero-sum game is not really something you find in nature at all. The, the idea that if you plant a seed, another seed must die is ridiculous. Even the idea that if you plant two seeds very close to one another and two trees grow up, you know, they, they will mutually affect one another for sure. And some of those ways that they affect each other might not be strictly beneficial, but they'll be interesting and it doesn't preclude growth, you know. Um, and so I think that we've, we've kind of forgotten that, that when, when somebody advances a narrative, we, we think that it must mean that all other narratives are, are automatically in competition to that and kind of must be destroyed, you know, and it's just, it's just bananas. It's not the way that people have ever really thought about how they live with one another. And it, it, it was not at all ubiquitous before this kind of intensely digital media came and kind of started colonizing our lives, you know, because in, on, online, if you're looking at one thing, you, you are by definition not looking at something else. You know, you are, there is only one purpose of being online, which is to elevate or to attract attention or to capture somebody's attention. And the, the, the goal is just to be as addictive as possible. Um, because, of course, all of our addiction to these spaces is making pots of money for somebody, um, you know, kind of a very small number of people. Um, and so, I mean, this, this will we'll probably give very different answers to this question, but my, my answer is to is kind of get offline, really, <laughs> and to kind of remember that the, the, the vision of human nature that we're being sold on these spaces is one that serves those platforms. It's not one that really has any interest in the fullness of humanity. Um, so I don't, I don't, I, it, it, it doesn't really answer your question, I suppose. I mean, it's kind of a hard question to answer, but I, 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 have, I have faith that this is not the end of the line because it, it wasn't the end of the line for so long. It's, it, it's actually a very new and very recent way of seeing the world. Um, this idea that only one, that there can be only one winner. It's just, it's, it's, it's just not true. In most situations, it's just not true. Yeah, and I think that also just the act of making literature, I mean, there's not a, a lot of people who do it. Well, when you're a writer, you only know writers, so you think everybody is a writer, but it, that's not true. Well, you know that's not true. <laughs> I have to tell myself that. I mean, only the act of making literature is a way of engaging to the world, um, because, well, like you also said, uh, it, literature is so complex and it shows that it's not just the zero-sum games and it shows all these perspectives. Just, just doing that, being one of those few people who does that is, I guess, a way, a way of engagement, no matter what it's about. Um, but then for myself, I, I try to uh, foolishly maybe separate like my public persona from my literature, I don't perceive to be my literature um, as activism, but maybe the deed of making literature is already activism, but there's never one th thing I want to tell my reader. I want to have the reader decide what his standpoint is. Um, but I am on social media and I do go to these demonstrations um, and then I do show on social media that I was there because I have followers, I have a platform, I'm on TV sometimes in the Netherlands, 
Um, so I do kind of feel a responsibility to show my political viewpoints, but that is quite tricky because there will be readers that are not able to distinguish between um, these very, maybe uh, flat is not the right word, but these very, you know, well, like you said, zero-sum opinions maybe. Um, that I might have or not have, or I don't know. Uh, I try to be a complex thinker in that. And then my literature that I want to be layered and rich. So it's very, I struggle with that as well, is my answer. It's a struggle, yeah. Bem, resta-nos agradecer a presença das nossas convidadas e a vossa presença nesta primeira sessão do, do Fólio 2024. Muito obrigada mais uma vez e resta-nos desejar-vos um bom festival. São cerca de 600 atividades, há muito para fazer e usufruir. Aproveitem e obrigada. <música>